Hey guys, it's your boy Charles here. And in today's interview, I have got with me Mr. Matt Daly. Matt, Hello. how's it going? Yeah, good, <laughs> thank you. We're on two very separate sides of the world right now, aren't we? For, for my audience, whereabouts are you whereabouts are you based at the moment, Matt? I'm based over in Barcelona. So I've been here for about yes. four and a half, five years, something like that. Had a, bit, a, a couple of trips over to England where I spent a little bit of time and then I couldn't help but just come back, you know, what it's like with the sun. <laughs> yeah, very nice. Yeah, no, I, I, I feel the same. I'm obviously here in, uh, I'm here in Mexico at the moment. So uh, yeah, getting other mm -hmm. side of the uh, other side of the world, but still uh, yeah, some good weather at least. Yeah, brilliant, man. <laughs> good stuff. Good stuff. Well, um, so today uh, we're going to talk about um, Circulate basically. So Matt runs, he's a co-founder um, of a digital marketing agency specializing in, in premium brands. Correct me if I'm wrong, Matt. Yeah, <laughs> but, <that's good>. uh, <laughs> so yeah, we're going to be talking all things um, digital marketing agencies. I think with this interview, uh, anyone that's looking to uh, set up a digital agency or run a digital agency, there's going to be some really good stuff that we're going to be getting into today. Matt, I'm going to pass the stage over to you, my friend. Just give us some information about Circulate, a little bit more information about yourself, where you started, where you are now, just so you know the audience gets a little bit more information about yourself. Yeah, it's a, it's a really cool one. So um, Circulate was started from a, our kitchen. So I run Circulate with my brother, uh, Danny Daly. We started it from our kitchen in Brighton and Hove about seven and a half years ago, something like that. And uh, we just started because we thought we could do it better. We thought we could run an agency better. And um, we had two very different kind of skill sets. And this is one of the things I wanted to kind of highlight as well is having unique skill sets with your co-founders is a really cool thing. So he's, he's more of a creative. I was more of a marketer slash techie type person. So the skill sets really merged quite well together. I think we ran it more as like a lifestyle business for the first couple of years, really. And after like when we actually expanded into Barcelona and Sheffield, this is when things really started to form for us. So we basically work with um, brands within the premium sectors, I guess. Um, and for us, it's all about paid social SEO and Google ads like that. There are three core kind of service offering. So we had to figure out what can we do to really find that magic formula around increasing sales, conversion rates, revenue, brand awareness for premium brands. So it's, it's been a really interesting kind of, I guess, journey in doing that because it didn't start off like that. It started off, you know, we'd take on anyone. Right? We'd yeah, take yeah. on I mean, Bob's fish, fish and chip shop down the corner or something. like. <laughs> but as we've evolved, it's, it's turned into something a bit more different, which is unique. And uh, yeah, I guess we're, we're in a good position now. We can take on some cool brands. <laughs> nice. No, yeah, no. I think that's always the case, isn't it? When we when you start out as an agency, you know, you just need oh, some yeah. business, and it will take on anyone. And you soon realise that that's probably not the best strategy to go in the long term. Yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those where you know, if I look back at when we first started, we had like two thousand pounds each. Like we we were, we didn't have any investment from anywhere else other than like we both had two grand each. If we failed. Like we would have had to go back. We would have had to go back and live with our parents, basically, at that point. So it would have, and that's as like a 20, 24 year old. That's really the last thing that you want to do. <laughs> yeah. So, like for us, it was it needs to work. Um, and I think one of the things that really helped us was actually doing contracting. So I got pulled in some digital agencies, did some contract work. Danny got pulled in and did design work. Built up a healthy balance in the business, and then that allowed us to take a bit more risk around, you know, our own marketing and who we brought on as a business. Why did you decide yeah. to, to set up an agency out of all of the, the, the business ideas or businesses that you could set up? Why did you, why did you decide an agency was the right route for you and your brother? It's funny because like we had a, we, we basically like started our first agency when we were at university. So okay. we literally had this agency. It was like a, a bit of a, a bit of a joke agency, I'd say, because we, we we launched it at uni. We didn't know anything about business and we were just building websites for people. I think we, we made like eight grand, I think, in our final year of, of uni, which paid for some of our 
like part-time kind of living costs, I guess. But the agency thing was always for us, we we're so passionate about like working across different industries. And I think like this is always something that's excited us. Like you're right, we could have gone and set up like a fashion brand or we could have gone and set up any kind of business, I guess. But for us, it was where our skill sets lied and something that we were really passionate about. So it's it just made sense, you know, like in, in the situation where you, you've got to start from somewhere. I think the, the future developments for us would be to do some kind of project uh, or product related business. I think this would be a really cool thing. Now we've got a, an established business, but back then it was all about the agency. <laughs> it's something we loved. Yeah, yeah. No, exactly. Um, it, makes, it makes perfect sense. So how did you get on your first, say, five, five paying clients? What, what was the process that you took? Uh, was it, you know, was it referrals? Was it just picking up the phone, cold calling? What was the, how did, it, how did it get started? It was an interesting start, honestly. Like we had our first five clients. So one of them came from an agency that I used to work at. Um, so basically that agency said the client wants to work with you. So because we built up a good, well, I guess I'd built up a good reputation with that client. Uh, and there was another one actually as well, which came from that agency because again, they wanted to work directly with me. Um, so that was kind of our first two big clients, I guess. But the other ones were just very interesting. So there's a shop in Brighton um, called Doc Rolls. Uh, we basically um, went in there and pulled out a plan of basically getting them to come fit a sign in our office. But the goal for us was to always like sell them a website, I think. So we we understood that there was a, a problem for, on their end. And <laughs> in kind of going in there, what we actually did is we we got them to do a bit of business for us. But in that that same kind of way, we also kind of sold our services and I think we ended up walking out of that with a 15,000 pound website build. And that was like a really interesting from kind of going into the shop and like within a month or six weeks, we basically sold that web, a new website to them and it, and it did a really good job. Um, and I think it was, it was opportunities like that, really looking around like a lot of it back then, like seven and a half years ago was walking around and asking people about, about marketing and if they needed any support. I remember Kath, a cafe that we went into at the time. And like we spent hours and hours on these proposals. And you've got to imagine like I'm working in some big agencies before. So like coming out and like doing, <laughs> going and knocking on doors is just the opposite way that it should work. But I think back then we didn't have any money. So we had to yeah. really be quite creative in how we got new clients. And that was kind of how we did it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's interesting. Like you said, sometimes you have to, you have to go back to basics and, and get in the trenches and, do things yeah. that maybe you don't want to do, you know, when you're starting out and you, like you said, you've got, you've got no money. Um, you have to make things happen quick. Yeah. The, the money thing was the big thing. Cause like, you know, when, when you've got nothing, you have to be quite creative in your approach. So we were like making Christmas cards for businesses, posting them underneath their doors, like just trying any way we could to possibly get in. And actually that, that was what actually won us a few projects, like just doing that helped us to get in on some brands. But but to really up that, it really then became about building relationships. Because when you build like some key relationships with other business owners and other agencies, that's really when it started to, to grow a lot more. I think we built some really key relationships that still stand today. That's been like the backbone of our growth as an agency. Yeah. And I think that's the main way that a lot of agencies grow as well. A lot of people I talk to that run agencies say exactly the same. For sure. I think the relationship building is a big one. You know, I find that, yes, you know, people are going to find you online, um, whether it's search, social, but yeah. that takes time for them to trust you. Um, and I think uh, the power of your network um, and existing relationships is going to, is probably going to be the starting point. 100%. I think like, if you look at like what we did then compared to what we do now, it's completely different. I mean, you won't catch me nine o'clock in the morning knocking on Bill's fish and chip shop. <laughs> like, it's not going to happen. Like, no yeah. way. You pay me to do it. <laughs> but but what you will see is like, obviously, we're launching stuff like YouTube channel and we're doing podcast shows and like this is like more interesting and fun. And I believe that building like human connections with people for me is the best way to develop business relationships. It's 
we call it more H to H now, not B to B. It's more human to human. And I yeah. find this more interesting and, and fun. <laughs> One question I've got for you, Matt, is, and I think agencies are always toying or tackling with this idea of where, whether they should niche down into either a particular service and specialize in, you know, whether it's social media, SEO, Google ads, um, or niche down into a particular industry or sector. So explain to me your kind of transition because you said that you would take on anyone at the start and then obviously <laughs> you've become a bit more selective and then you look like you've you've effectively specializing in 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 more premium brands how did yeah. you come to that realization uh and what would you suggest to to say agency owners that are maybe starting out maybe in their first one to two years would you say they should do that from day one or do you think they should build up some experience first and take on, you know, people from different industries uh, and then decide, okay, this is the route we want to niche down to? What's, what's your take on that? Yeah, it's really interesting because I can give you some real life data on that as well. So, I mean, since we niche down into premium, like we grew 60%. So that's year on year growth, 60%, yeah. um, which is interesting. And, and my cousin is also called, Charles, <laughs> uh, he niched into SEO. So this, it's a different transition, like say, so niching into SEO, we niched into like premium kind of sites, but his business has flown since he's done that. And it's, it, ha it happened around similar times. I think it was probably about a year and a half ago. Um, and I think niching into a, a specific industry or service is a really good idea um, because I guess it makes you more relevant to the end customer. Like the, the customer that's looking for an SEO agency, maybe, like they're going to know that you're really expert in SEO if you just offer SEO. But, you know, for us, if you're a premium company, uh, let's say you're a premium fashion brand, you know you're in the right place when you're talking to us because you're dealing with an agency that just deals with premium brands. Uh, and don't get me wrong, we obviously have like a backlog of customers that aren't premium because they've been with us in some cases for seven or eight years or whatever. Um, and and I think this is a really interesting way to spin off. But if you're just starting your first agency, I really think it depends where you've come from. Because if you if you know you can kind of grow your network quickly, and I think that's going to help you a lot. Um, if you don't have the network, you need to kind of develop it and that's where you kind of take on a lot of different projects um but if you've already got like a solid network you think you can get in projects then niche down straight away because that's going to make you the specialist in the area whereas i i feel like if you haven't built that network and you and not many people know you as it is um then it's a much more difficult position to kind of get sales in so you because you need to develop that pipeline from the start so it's, it's really a tough one, I guess. Um, it kind of comes with a every kind of um, approach, I guess, dependent on the person. Um, and like I said, we started without niching and we did that for about six years. So it, we, and we grew in that time. But then when we built our network and I guess the people we knew in the industry, that, that gave us a much better kind of projection to grow when we did niche. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, no, perfect sense. I think, you know, sometimes you, you, like you said, if you haven't got the network within that industry or sector, yeah. then it's probably best to start broader, uh, yeah. take on various clients, figure out what industries you get good results for or you like working with. And then you yeah. can then obviously go more tunnel vision, I think. Exactly. Sure. I, I think I think when you're starting out, it's it really is a process of just trying to get the business in and, and deliver results. So doesn't really matter what business it is it's it's really just get the clients in that you think are going to be valuable to you and you're going to be able to provide value to them like having a, a matching kind of scoring system between like the client you just don't you don't want to bring on a dickhead client like let's face yeah. it you don't want to bring someone that's, that's going to destroy your mental health and your well-being and your staff's well-being this is really not what you want but yeah, in, in terms of like actually niching down, I think it's good if you've got a good network. So this is quite this is quite a big question, but what, what are the biggest lessons? Uh, and let's say also, yeah, lessons, mistakes, 
I mean, really, there's no such thing as a mistake, really. It's a lesson at the, yeah. at the, at the end of the day. But what's the biggest um, lessons that you've learned from, you know, building and, and scaling your agency? A bit of a joke one is make sure you pay your um, dark charges because uh, I've just had a £450 bill come in for a dark charge, which is an expensive lesson. <laughs> and that was on a business trip. So make sure you do that. Um, yeah. Being seriously about it. I think the biggest lessons we've learned as a business is to stand your ground um, and and always care as well. I think there's two there's two kind of sides to it. So you need to be you need to show the client that you're expert in what you do. So you need to push back and you need to set those expectations because if you haven't kind of stood your ground and set the expectations, you're going to get walked all over and it's going to be a, a horrible show in that sense. Um, but at the same time, I think. The number one, and this actually comes from my mentor. Um, he, he, he expanded his business to 175 staff, I think well over 12 million in revenue. And I asked him, why was it, why did it get so big and, and how did you manage that? And he said, it's because he just cared. Like, I think that's something that we've really tried to, to follow through in our business. And when I say care, I don't just mean for the, the clients, I mean for the staff as well. Yeah. So it's very easy to be bad leaders um, because you just look at the finance. But actually, I think one of the biggest things we've learned, aside of the dark charge, is the <laughs> is the company culture side and actually developing that like really, really far. I'd say we have a really good company culture at Circulate. And that's taken a lot of time to work on. Um, but I think now that we've got it, it's much easier to, to maintain. And... Those are my big lessons, really. And, and I guess in terms of failures, we've had times where our company culture has been shy, honestly. Like, it's been really bad. Um, and I think it's it's good to open up about that, um, where we've not been the best leaders. Um, but I think understanding that and becoming a bit vulnerable around it as well is really important for your growth. So recognising when you've really fucked up as a leader is, like, one of the, the things which highlights our success, actually, making mm. sure. We're, we're being open and vulnerable to, to things that are going on. We're not always going to be right. Like whatever we do, there's going to be things that we really mess up on. Um, but it's about learning. And I think that's the most important thing. I think that the whole, the whole process is learning. No one, you know, you're, yeah. not, you're not taught at, at school, uh, you know, how to be a good leader, um, how, to, how, to run a, how to run a business. In terms of, let's delve into that, the company culture side of things. Yeah. How did, knowing that, you know, at one point you said, you know, the company culture was was not good. How did you address that? What are a few things that you put in place to improve improve on that? Yeah, so if you think about company culture, right, it's the same as digital marketing. You have to be able to measure it. So there's got to be some measurement of how you're actually making it better. Because without that, you're just sitting there with fluffy figures, I guess. And you're saying, well, actually, I believe the staff are happier. <laughs> but you don't know because you've got no measurement. So the first thing that I did uh, was put in place, I think, uh, a tool called Office Vibe. And this is really cool. And it's anonymous kind of um, feedback from teams, more or less. And, and this gave us a really, really solid bit of data, actually, to, to kind of understand where the sticking points were for the team. It, it looks at things like recognition. It looks at relationships with your peers, relationships with your manager. And what you can see over time is you can see trends in the score and the participate participation rate. Sorry, can't even say that word. Um, and, and what you can then do is actually analyze that data and make tweaks in the business. So one of the things we did uh, was we looked at the data and went, well, people don't feel like they're getting enough recognition. So let's create a, uh, a channel in Slack, which is dedicated for recognition. So it's called the Circulate Shoutouts. So what you now see is the team actually shouting out to other team members and giving them the recognition. And, and actually, I think a side of pay rises and all this kind of stuff that you get in business, like the team most value recognition. Like this is like one of the big things that they love. And um, I think that's probably the, the big, the biggest part of like, what started to tick things off with us to get that better culture is just mm. understanding the measurement behind it. I like that. I think that's, that's, you're right. I think recognition is, is a big one. You know, yeah. people think that, Oh, it's just about, um, you know, paying your, your staff more money, 
but the reality is sometimes they just want to feel valued. Yeah, it's true. Is that if if you look at like what COVID's done, COVID's been a really interesting one because I, for one, hate working at home. Like I absolutely detest it. Like I, I would much rather be in an office. But I know like there's a flexibility around work schedules and stuff. And the team actually, in the end, like they prefer working in the office than working at home. And I think that really shows like if you make a good culture in your business, then, you know, you're going to have people wanting to come in and work in that. And I think that's really important. Like one of the team the other day was talking about Circulate being like an extended family. And I think that's really nice when you've got actual team members without us prodding them with a stick saying, go on, say this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hear that, but you know you've got people saying these things, and I think that's that's really like rewarding for me. Like one of the big things we want to focus on is having the best working environment, like across the industry. That's like our main goal. I think that's important. <laughs> no, I think you're right. It, it uh, if you you know if your team are happy, um, they're gonna they're gonna put more work in, or they're gonna deliver better results. Um, which obviously True. then in in turn is going to uh, help your clients as well. So, yeah, it makes perfect sense. It's, uh, I think company culture is, is, is a big one. One thing I, I, was, I was pondering was, you know, with, with, with my agency, we, we, we effectively went remote and we had been way before COVID times. But you guys took, I guess, the more traditional approach of uh, an office, staff, and, and yeah, being in the, in, in the same place. Um, I wanted to get your take on the, you know, why you did that. And do you think there's any limitations to having a remote team? And, you know, I'd love to get your honest opinion on that. Um, because yeah. there's a lot of agency owners that are like, oh, you know, I want to build an agency. I want it to be remote because I want to build a sort of a, a lifestyle business. And yeah, but then maybe there's, there's some potential downsides to doing that. 100%. I think there's loads of benefits to being remote. Like, I think staff, if they're more geared towards remote working, it'd be probably be a bit happier. Um, but maybe the, one of the reasons why we didn't go fully remote is because, again, looking back at that working environment thing, like we wanted to create offices which were the best working environment. And this has just been our goal all the way along. I also found like in terms of like learnings, you know, you've got a few junior uh, like members of team, like it's really hard for them to progress um, without like a really solid game plan in place around remote working. Um, we've had a couple actually during the COVID period where maybe it just hasn't really worked out because we've not been able to give them as much time because they're not in the office. And this is actually like, as like someone that's coming into digital marketing or into like a creative industry, I I would almost want to be surrounded by people that know their stuff and you can get feedback straight away from them. I feel like there's limitations to working remote, but I guess the on the flip side of that, where you are at, I guess you've got like a really highly technical team of people that, you know, don't need any um, assistance in, in, in what they're doing because they're kind of fully remote consultants, I guess. Um, I mean, I'm just taking a guess on that. Yeah, well. it's well, the, the biggest thing with, I think with the remote teams is we have to build really strong processes in place. Yeah, it's true. Um, yeah. And we also need to be in, you know, constant communication because sometimes those channels can slip off, you know? Um, yeah. So it's making it's sure that information is relayed very clearly otherwise you know you're not always going to get the results that you want um and there's sometimes miscommunication uh yeah. i i would imagine flipping it back to yourself as well that with uh an office and you've got staff in the same place there's a quicker feedback loop you know you can quickly yeah, yeah. discuss stuff yeah. and get things done and, and out versus remote where there's a bit of a delay sometimes in in the um in the communication yeah i think i think you're right in terms of like us it's it has impacted us when we have had staff at the office but that's when the processes kick in so like you say making sure that we've got that process to work remotely um, and to be fair we've worked a lot of the last two years remotely um so it, it works um i think for us it's it's more about like 
being able to provide more support in person and have things going quicker. And we're really fast paced. So it's, it's sometimes hard when you're working remotely. This is just my personal feedback, I guess, um, to get things done as quickly as we do. Whereas if you're sitting next to someone, I find it a lot, a lot easier to kind of get those results in. But at the same time, like say, I think if you're like really, really highly efficient in what you're doing, and you don't need to ask so many questions, I think it can work really well. Whereas I feel like if you are emerging yourself into an industry and you have to ask lots of questions, that's when it really struggles. And I think that's for us, like, because obviously we had, we had some more junior members kind of joining as we were expanding. And I think that was probably the hardest part for us during COVID was, was trying to develop and train them remotely was because we're not a massive agency. I mean, we're an agency of 12 people. Um, but you know, like as you're kind of scaling, like you need to have more and more training documentation and processes in place for that. And I think when it happens so quickly, it's just hard to, to manage that, I guess. There's lots of pros and cons, I think. Like Yeah. <laughs> oh, for talk. sure, for sure. I think there's there's challenges on 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 both sides. I don't think there's one correct answer. I think you kinda have to do what works best for you and your team or yeah, and set it up in the in the way that yeah, you feel is right. I mean, I'm fully remote. If you think about yeah. it, I'm 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 the only one in Barcelona right here. So I'm we we did have a team here before, but we opened up a whole office in Manchester to basically create a new uh, paid team. Gotcha. And, and I went over and set that up, and I was in the UK for six months or so to to actually set that up. But now, like, I'm fully remote here. Like, there's no one else here. It's just me. And all the rest of the team are in England. <laughs> so I, mean, I guess it's the same with you. Like you're you're in Mexico currently, and before yeah. that, Bali. And yeah, I have team. I have t team members all over the world. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's uh, there's obviously <laughs> some issues. You know, you, time zone differences and things like that. But again, that's where the things, the tools, and the processes come into place. Yeah. Which and we have some. Uh, I can't can't quite disclose yet, but we've got some. Yeah, interesting developments here at Fine Tune in terms of uh, we may be going back to a little bit more traditional uh, office setup with some with some stuff, but I can't quite disclose that yet because we've got other other parties involved. But uh, oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, some yeah, exciting <laughs> stuff coming here. But so in terms of then your setup, so that my audience got a little bit of idea how you guys are set up. So you said you've got an office in in Sheffield. Yeah. Is that right? And then you've got one in, in Manchester and then obviously yourself, you're in Barcelona. So there's, yeah. those are the two, you're, you're mainly based out of the UK in terms of the comp your company. Yeah, yeah. Like um, we, the reason why we opened up in Barcelona was because we started acquiring businesses out here. So, um, well, or new clients out here. So um, in Europe, so it made sense for someone to be here. So we, we got some clients here about four or five years ago. And um, from that I moved um it also i really wanted to live here so it was it was the perfect transition for me but yeah over it we got a, basically a, a content marketing team over in sheffield and then a paid team over in manchester but what we're trying to do now is kind of build both of those skill sets in the offices so we're just building up two different locations and having two talent pools as well mm. i think that's one of the reasons why we went to manchester because there's a lot of talent there's a lot of big agencies and there's a lot of talent. So it's it's a good place to be for marketing. A lot of good brands as well. Yeah, Manchester's definitely a bit of a hub, I think, isn't it? You've obviously yeah. got, you know, London, but Manchester in the UK and even Sheffield, I've heard, is there's some, there's some yeah. good talent there as well. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Makes makes perfect sense. So let's let's delve in then to, um, to some marketing and sales. I want to get your take, Matt, on... Well, firstly, marketing and what you found in the past has worked the best for attracting new clients. And secondly, what you guys are doing now in 2022 in terms of your own marketing strategy for Circulate and what you found is working well for your clients or what your plan is. Obviously, we're, we're still early on in 2022 but your plan for for your clients and uh and what you think what channels you found work well it'd be great to get your take on that so firstly starting with what you found worked well in the past to attract yeah. new clients and then we'll we'll go through that whole transition it's it's really funny because 
what we found worked in the past is like a really interesting question because we really did no marketing. Uh, so we basically just optimized our site, got ranking in Google for a range of different terms. Uh, we get sporadic leads come through, but the main source of our work comes through uh, referrals. Um, just based on doing a good job for a client, then passing us on to another lead and, and vice versa. And like around agency partnerships, we've got like a range of different partners that basically just send us leads. That's basically how we got to where we are. Um, and we rank like number one in the UK currently as it stands for paid social agency and other various kind of terms. And uh, we put a lot of work into our content so that we can get to there. That's kind of a summary of, of how we've got to where we are. And actually like we're, we're just kind of getting started now, which is funny because we're like seven and a half years in, as I said, and, and I feel like we've really not taken our own marketing that seriously. I think, Honestly, Matt, it's very common amongst agencies yeah. because the reality is when you're starting out, you, you've, not, you've not got the budget. You're up against much, much larger agencies. So trying to, to rank on Google or even you know, run paid ads, paid ads against you know, some of your bigger competitors uh, is going to be tough. Um, and yeah, you're right. I've spoken to many agency owners and they're like, well, we've we've grown quite organically. We've, it's the network, yeah. it's the referrals, the strategic partnerships, like you said, with other agencies. Yeah. I think those, those are big ones. Um, focusing on your network for sure. Yeah. Like, honestly, we wouldn't have, like, if we would have had a bad network, we wouldn't have got to where we are today. So it's, it's all been around network. And, and to be honest with you, like if we would have done what we are planning now, like five or six years ago, we'd probably be like a three or four million pound turnover agency now because like I genuinely believe like what we've got coming is that like going to be huge because we're basically putting ourselves on the map where no one's really heard of us <laughs> like mm. in yep. the scene, uh, that fashion brand that is looking for an agency that are looking on YouTube for some cool content around how to develop your your fashion kind of marketing strategy all this kind of stuff we've never put ourselves on the map for it. So I believe that like doing that and actually thinking about useful content and videos, we've got the daily hustle, which uh, I'm sure you'll probably link to is, is a new YouTube channel. That yeah, Danny and I, it. yeah. It's really funny. Like it's going to be a really awesome channel because what we're doing is we're, we're not just trying to make it like a digital marketing hub. We actually want to make it hilarious as well. So the first video we pushed out was very much like about like our client meeting and stuff, but we've got some really comical episodes coming up. I'm not going to say anything right now because Daniel will kill me, uh, but we're <laughs> a lot of money investing into this channel. So we're going to be, uh, well, we're going to be taking a helicopter out next week, which is quite fun. We're going to say anything on that <laughs> as well, but like we've got this and we've got some, like I want to basically produce content, which gets us in front of the right people. Okay. And, and then they kind of get to know who we are. We've also got the podcast coming, which is exactly the same as well. So speaking to like, you know, leaders in business, um, just putting ourselves on the map. I, I think if you are going to start a digital agency, start with this because we kind of didn't. <laughs> okay. And I think it would be a lot bigger now if we had of. And you see a lot of agencies out there that have grown very quickly because they're just adapting these new practices. So. But that's where we missed the trick, to be honest with you. No, I think that makes sense. It's it's a long term strategy, isn't it? And yeah. it, it it takes time. Um, but I think documenting your journey and, and your process, you know, it's uh, it, it gets you out there and gets you known. It's it's always a challenge because when you're starting out, you you want to take on clients, and then you're doing the client work yourself, and then you don't have as much time to focus on your own marketing. So it's a it's a balancing act oh, it's a challenge how did you um in terms of your role and then danny's role your uh, your brother yeah. and your business partner um in the business now where were you previously like were you were you doing client work and have you been able to remove yourself from the day-to-day -day running of the business um yeah. just to give give me an idea of sort of where you're at, at yeah so in terms of like how it used to be, obviously, was I, I was kind of the digital director, I guess. So I, I oversaw all the strategies, led the team from a, a client strategy point of view, as well as kind of tallying up with Danny to like run the business, like 
basically get things done. And Danny was always um, kind of on the, the creative side of things. What's happened in the last year is we've taken ourselves out of actually delivering stuff. Um, so he's he's become our CEO. Um, so he kind of leads all of the financials and all of this stuff, uh, manages the team over in Manchester and Sheffield because it does, really doesn't make sense for me to be managing them um, when he's so close to them. And then from my end, I'm now the CMO. So I'm managing a marketing, um, like collaborating with Danny on all of this stuff that we're doing with the YouTube, the podcast, pushing out new content, working with the team. But more recently, I've been jumping back in again um, to basically strategize our partnerships and who we want to be working with. And as well as that, thinking about like, you know, the client strategies that we've got, what can we be more innovative around? What can we do better? Are there any advancements, any weaknesses that we've got at the moment? So I'm kind of sitting over the top now, just overseeing everything. Um, I'm not doing any client work, but I'm kind of sitting there as more of a strategist to to steer the team and support and advise. And and I guess any client relation issues like that arise and this happens, like sometimes you get a client that's a bit annoyed about something, they'll come to me and chat to me about it. <laughs> And then I'll fix it. And and this is the great, this is actually one of the most rewarding things I'd say is when there are problems, being able to fix it and step in is cool. No, it's, I think it's, you're kind of in a good position. It's where a lot of uh, agency owners want to be able to get to. Um, I think, yeah. you know, many are, us, um, as my mentor would say, stuck in the weeds of their own business. You know, yeah. they're, they're doing a lot of the, they're putting out fires with terms of client work and, and they don't ever take a step out uh, and look at the, the top level overview and, and be able to, okay, where are we actually going with this agency and, and focusing on their own you know, strategy in terms of growth. How long did it take you to get to that stage? Like, would you suggest uh, agency owners do that as quickly as they can? Or is it based on obviously the amount of revenue that they can bring in in order to hire the right talent to to actually to manage those clients yeah it's a really good question i i really believe that you know when you're starting the business is your vision and you need to be part of that vision so i believe you need to get your hands dirty to some extent it's really important for the evolution of your company but also so that you can set all of the the processes and all of the stuff that you need to do to make sure that you can bring clients on and run it effectively. I really think it comes down to like how many people in the business can basically take parts of your day off of you. Because when you have someone that manages the communications on a client account, when you have someone that can manage the full aspects of the digital delivery, like this is when you can start to step back a bit. And I think it really comes down to your sales funnel then, because you need to make sure that you bring in enough business to be able to get to that point because it's all good saying yeah but by the time you get to five people like i'm going to take a step back but if you've not got a strong enough pipeline then you're you're going to be taking a step back things will start burning and then you're going to have to jump back in again and we've been in that position so many times one of one of the reasons why i guess like we we've got to where we are is because we have to come in and fix things and and i think it's important to do that as well so it's to give you a, an answer on that, it's kind of like, I think it depends as to how your business looks and, and who you have in your team. Like if you feel that you can give Jack, one of my team members, a, a client management on an account and he can fully kind of look after that, then I think that takes something off of you, which allows you to go and do something else. And, mm. and when you develop that, that's when you can start thinking. But I really think it's important to try and get an overview. Like Danny and I look at Circulate as a super yacht. And this is how we do our analogy. If we're stuck in the engine room, fixing pipes and things that are, you know, keeping the engine going, which is our services, then we can't see what's going out on the deck. So we need to have someone out on the deck to really see where we're actually navigating. And unless you've got that, then, you know, you're going to fucking crash into something, aren't you? <laughs> Along the way, like it's, it's going to be a nightmare. So I think it's like you say, it's important to to really try and get towards that. It just depends on the circumstance. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I think you're right. Yeah, no, I I I agree. Like it's all well saying that you're gonna get a top level overview or you're gonna take a step back and just focus on the marketing and sales of the company. 
but if you don't have the, the the revenue there to be able to hire the right talent to bring in, then it's not going to work. <laughs> you know. So yeah, it's a balancing act. But like you said, bringing out like looking at what you're responsible for and uh, the different hats that you wear, and then saying, okay, um, I'm now in a position that. I'm going to get someone to focus on our paid ad side of things or our SEO side of things in terms of our client work. And then I can take a step back and, you know, focus on growth. Um, yeah. It, they said it's all, it's all dependent on the, on the situation, I think. Yeah. Because uh, if you, if you put it into perspective of us, for example, let's say we got to 80,000 in revenue, right. And that took us four months to get to, it might take someone else two months to get to that. And, and they might be able to hire people three times as fast as us. So by the time we've kind of got to that stage, you know, they're already out of the business looking at where the ship's going. Like it, it really comes down to how quickly you can evolve and, and, and get the right skills in. And that's the most important because there's no good going out on top of it to look over the business if you've not got the right skill sets to deliver the business. Mm. I really think that's quite a big one probably transitions nicely on to, well, let's, let's talk sales. So, yeah. you know, cause the, the reality is a business, you know, the business is just a hobby. If, it, if it's not bringing in any sales, then it's not really a business. So Matt, I'd love to get your take on, obviously we talk marketing, how you're bringing in, you know, potential new clients. How do you best convince those clients to come on board with circulate? You know, what, what are some tips that you could give my audience some tactics that, are going to convert, you know, you improve your, your conversion rate. Cause you know, every potential client you speak to is going to turn is, is actually going to equate to, to business. So I'd love to get your take on, on building relationships, how you're able to, to generate more business from your pipeline. Um, yeah. Anything that you could give on that front would be great. Yeah. So I think this all kind of starts with the qualification process. So number one, you've got to make sure they're a good fit for your business and, you want to have some kind of scoring system that measures that. Like, are they are they fun to work with? Are they going to pay the bills? Uh, have you done che- checks on them? Like, we do credit checks um, to understand their profitability. There's no good spending all your time on someone that's basically not going to pay their invoice. Um, but I think that's like basically the first step of it is to really qualify them and also make sure that they really have a good cultural alignment as well and and that personality fit is good because like I say like with if you if you want to focus on like making your team happy and you want to have a, a much better kind of work-life balance then like you don't want stressful clients like there's some clients which I look at now and say I really wish we just never brought them on and they're no longer clients of ours because I fired them um because yeah. in in the situation they cause so much stress um, and it was generally came down to the fact that I didn't qualify them properly. And I, I had to take full accountability on that. And that was one of the lessons that I guess we learned as we're kind of growing the business is like the qualification is really important because, and, and the expectations of what they're going to get even more important. Like there's, there's customers that, you know, they can come on and they, you, you tell them you're doing paid social and all of a sudden uh, they think that you're managing all of their organic social too. And that gets yeah. you into a disagreement. And this has happened. This is a real life scenario of, of, you know, like where I actually have to take a step back and go, right, I really need to educate the clients better on, on this. So I think qualification and expectations is really important. Now, in terms of actual nitty gritty details, like once you've, once you've qualified them and you've got them through, you really need to think about their timelines. Um, so there's a couple of important things to think about here. So when are they looking to kick the project off? Is it, is it in six months, three months, a year? Most clients will turn around to you and say yesterday. You'd probably laugh at that one because you probably had that. <laughs> and, and that's usually quite a good client to have because, you know, it, it shows that a little bit of unorganization, but at the same time, it shows that they're keen. So they're, they're good. They want to move fast. And I, and I quite like that. The other thing is obviously make sure you get a budget from that first phone call. With the budget, I think this is really important because – you need to make sure that it aligns with your minimums. And I think you clearly state what your minimum get out of bed fee is really. Like yeah. you make sure that you're upfront with them because that's then going to save you a lot of time 
like pitching a service that they just simply can't afford. And then I think on top of that, so if you if you you understand the timelines, you understand their budget, you know that they're a good client to work with, um, you need to set a pitch date to basically present. Uh, one of the things where we've gone wrong in the past, and sometimes if I've not got enough time, I still fall into the same trap, is I, I forget to send a uh, pitch date to actually present instead of, so what typically what a lot of people do is they send over a proposal and it might be this really detailed proposal. The client looks at it, goes straight to the pricing, I guess, ah, and they don't get the chance for you to actually pitch it to them. So the main thing I would say to anyone listening is if you get the chance to, to get a decent client in, make sure in that phone call that you have with them, you get a pitch date secured so that you've actually got a date where they know they're getting the proposal and you're presenting it to them. Because if, if you don't do that, then what happens is they can easily just go cold. Um, also, it means that you're, you're basically not being having your time wasted because you're you're able to go and sell yourself and your values and what you do as a business which i guess dri drives me on to the next point which is always have like your mission in there as well so like for us we've got a really close collaboration with a children's hospital um we really love that brand and that's become part of like why we run our business as well like these passion side projects that we've got like they give us purpose and I think that's actually helped us to win a lot of business because they can see we're not just about like, you know, gen generating loads of money for our agency because like we're also supporting lots of like CSR activity. And I think clients really love that. Um, so it's, I think just to kind of give a few top tips on it, we could obviously dive into this for a long time. Um, but those would be like my, my core elements that I'd probably say, like a, your big things you really need to focus on. And that's going to give you the best chances of winning is, is just really making sure they've got the budget, making sure they're good, like fit with their personality, getting those timelines set in and just generally making sure that, you know, everything's nice and organized so you, you can get to the point of presenting your project. No, I like that. I, I think what you mentioned about the, uh, the pitch and not just sending the proposal, but actually <laughs> setting a date in the calendar to speak to them and go through it with them, I think is super important. I know I've made that mistake in the past of just sending a proposal, not really qualifying them. And it's just been a complete waste of time and they've gone cold and, you know, you've just wasted hours and hours um, spent proposal writing. Um, and recently with a client in the States and uh, I haven't even had a response back. So it's, and I, and because yeah. I actually had this in January, we completed 11 proposals so it was intense and each proposal takes 10 to 12 hours. So you got to think, right, in January, I probably spent the best part of 130 hours complete, completing proposals. Like I was hustling away in January, like ridiculous hours. I, I wasn't drinking. I wasn't really socializing. I was just basically in my computer yeah. creating proposals. And hopefully a large chunk of that will get signed off, but I'm not expecting it all to get signed off because that would be ridiculous. But yeah, like it's 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 really important to to try and tick the boxes. But I missed it a couple of times on those proposals. And funny enough, those are the ones we've not had any responses back from. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. It's true. I I've 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 certainly made um plenty plenty of mistakes in terms of, you know, our own sales process not being the best it can be. Uh, yeah. and missing uh, you know opportunities because of that or wasting time, <laughs> one of the two. Honestly, the, the, when you think about like the fact that you could potentially w waste like 12 hours of your time, that's like so valuable. Like if you think about my rate being billed out at 150 an hour, that's a ridiculous amount of money. Like we're talking like almost two grand on that, you know, like yeah. of just time that you're just throwing away in the air. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's not, worth thinking about is it <laughs> <You know? laughs> i i thought to myself this morning i had some feedback from one of them and they thought we were amazing they loved the agency they thought it was great but the thing is we didn't win it because uh, there was another agency that just had more work that they completed within the educational sector so like for us it was like ah bugger, like that was a lot of time we spent on that one but at the same time like there's a good learning there. And one of the questions actually that I'm going to ask to my next client that I do a proposal for 
is what other agencies are pitching and are they relevant to your industry? Do they have other case studies relevant to your industry? And what does that criteria, that winning criteria look like for you? So maybe that's another thing as well. Like what, what do you yeah. take to win? No, I, re I think that's, that's important. Uh, and that's something that's overlooked as well. You know, yeah. the, the person you're speaking to doesn't often tell you who else they're speaking to about yeah. the work. So you could spend all this time and then you realize they're actually speaking to another five, six agencies and they're just fishing for prices yeah. or they're not really that serious. Um, yeah. So you, your chances of actually winning the business are, are becoming more narrower, you know, slimmer and slimmer. <laughs> I'll tell you what, uh, I spoke to um, my, my mentor about doing RFPs. And I was like, oh, they, they seem really great. We should go for some. I know it's going to be like a, a heavy investment of time and stuff, but like, I really think if we go through the process and really tickle the boxes, we could win. And he was like, you are going to hate it. He was like, you're going to hate going for RFPs because like they're basically a lot of the time they know what agency they want to work with. They, yeah. they, they go into an RFP process because they have to, it's regulations. And like, it's, it, I'm glad that, that I've got a mentor to basically steer me in that way because otherwise I might have spent more of those RFP times. Whereas actually, I think it's better to invest your time into proposals that you really believe in and ones that you've got a better chance of winning through qualifying better. Mm, no, right. I, I get that option. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I think it's, I think it's important to do that uh, for sure. This is a big one, Matt. Yeah, which is and I know that you've actually been, uh, you know, open about it in the past is, is dealing with the, you know, the stress of, of, of running an agency, you know, the impact that can have on on your own mental health. What have you found, you know, has worked for you to be able to, you know, try and minimize that stress, making sure that you're obviously taking some time off or, you know, not just hustling and grinding it out because, yeah. You know, as we both know, that probably leads to burnout and uh, and a lot worse things. So, yeah, it'd be great to get your your take on, on what you've done to to be able to to deal with that and and obviously manage your own mental health. Yeah, it's, it's like you say, it's a huge one for me. And like to anyone listening, I guess it's it's a bit of an eye opener because like I lost my mum through like mental health stuff, and like she was really not in a great place. Um, and it was really unfortunate because there were things that I didn't understand around the why, the reason why she behaved the way she did. And for that reason, I didn't really see her that much. So I wish I would have understood it a bit better at the time. But, you know, this has actually been quite a positive impact for me because it's made me really understand my own mental health a lot better and signs and visibility of like burning out and how I feel and being vulnerable to stuff. Like in the podcast I've done with um, a guy called Chris Cannell, you should follow him. Um, he talked about like, you know, he he built a million, I'm sorry, a multi-million pound company. I think it was like 28 million pounds or something. And he lost it all. And like he, he hit rock bottom and he had multiple suicide attempts and stuff like this. And like, I think in terms of how like people go through those situations, like life can be a lot worse than what we think it is. Like, you know, you can, you can end up in that position and have to rebuild from there. And you can end up in my position, which is, you know, losing your mum and having to really understand things a bit better. But going back to the, the core basics, I guess, is how do we deal with the pressure of mental health and stress? Like you'll probably see today, like I felt incredibly stressed this morning. And, and I thought to myself, like, I just needed an hour just to go out and do something different. So I, I basically at half 11 in the morning, I just went out for a run and I got back and I felt like 10 times better. And, and it was a good, it was a good, um, a good thing to do. Um, I find that like doing, combining that, I'm not drinking as well. Like I'm getting better sleep because I'm trying to fix my routine so that I can sleep uh, earlier. I think like noticing these small little micro things in your life make a big difference in terms of your happiness. And I think the main thing is just being really open and vulnerable, like with your team, with your family, with your friends. If you've got a problem, just talking about it because there's a lot of people that don't talk about it and then end up in a really bad pace. So for me, I, I like to have a support bubble of people that I feel comfortable in talking about stuff with. Um, and I think that's 
that's what's helped me to develop quite a strong head, I guess. Like I've had periods in my life where I've been really anxious and I've thought I was like in, in really bad points where I thought, fuck, I feel like I'm dying. Like, and this is like the worst place that I've ever been. And even like in the last quarter of last year, I felt immensely burnt out because just being go, go, go. I think it took 11 days off in the year up until like October was when I took my, my first serious break. And now I just realize I need to take more time off. I need to prioritize more work, uh, life balance. I think this is really important because at the end of the day, there's only one of you, isn't there? And when you're mm. gone, you're gone. So you're going to enjoy doing what you're doing, but you need to prioritize your health first. And I think that for me has become like the main thing. So like at the moment, for example, I'm, I'm doing like an hour and a half of exercise a day. I'm smashing it. Like I'm going running and I'm going to the gym and I'm not drinking and I'm just trying to basically get my routine together. Like this helps a lot. You feel a lot better when you're in, when you, when you're in shape in terms of like your routine, I think everything else just falls into place and you can deal with stressful situations a lot easier. Nah, I couldn't agree more. The health is number one at the end of the day. If you haven't got yeah. your health, you haven't got anything. It's yeah. all well trying to grind away and build a, you know, a big business. Um, but as you just stated with your, with your friend, you know, can build a multi-million pound business and be in the worst mental state that, yeah. that is, that you, you know, possible. You do have to prioritize your health and, um physical and mental i'll tell you what i'll be completely vulnerable on this one as well like so i think this is huge like i basically last year bought my first house and uh you'll probably remember seeing it on on instagram or whatever and i bought my i bought like a really fancy car and this big house and what have you and like i ended up feeling shit like really shit i was like what why have i done this i'm not even happy here and like I think when, when, leading up to that, I was like, oh, my God, this is all going to happen and blah, blah, blah. And then I got it. And it was like a, such an anticlimax. And I was like, I just I just wasn't happy. That's why I moved back here. And I was like, right, I just need to, like, rent part of this house out, <laughs> sell the car, <laughs> get back to Barcelona. And to be honest with you, although I had a bit of burnout last year, like coming back really helped because I'm around a lot of really strong uh, influential people here like that make a huge impact on my life and when I was in Manchester I had no one like I was yeah. basically I had my team which was great but I didn't have any friends there really I had a, a handful of friends and it was it was a lot harder to kind of make friends because you're in a lockdown so mm. I found a lot of my time just got absorbed into like you know buying a car and a house and all this stuff but it's like here like in the evenings here, I'm out running up in the mountains or I'm down on the beach or like I've just got, a, I've just refurbed our terrace out here and it looks so sick. Like doing projects like this that I find a lot of joy from and I find a lot of love in doing. And I think I just didn't have that in England. And this is why I think I'm really glad to be back here. And like I say, that's, that's me being really open and vulnerable about a situation. And I feel like people need to do that more. Like in yeah. talk about their own personal circumstance. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I think you know everyone paints a picture on on social media, and sometimes the people that are um, outwardly showing the most are, are often <laughs> equal. You know, in a, innerly, the, or it's not even a word, is it? Uh, you know, inside. I think it's you yeah. know they they they're not they're, they're not happily innerly. <laughs> that was with me last year. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. like, like literally, and at the same time, I broke up with my girlfriend at the time, and it was just horrendous. Like, I was sitting in England and just thinking, what the hell is going on? And um, you're right. Like, I was posting things like I was happy. And I was like, I'm not happy. <laughs> I'm <was> sad. <laughs> yeah, w look, we're, we're all guilty of doing it. You know, yeah, there's no one's no one's perfect in that situation. Which we're kind of always trying to project a certain image, but equally that it, you know it can lead you down some dark paths and not always good. Yeah, that's um, true. You know, you look at it now, like it's actually a bit of a reflection of how much better life is now. So it's it's nice, and I think like you're not putting focus on money is a huge huge thing for your happiness. Like, don't don't put all the emphasis on making money. Like put emphasis into making your life better, might being happier, for spending time with people that add value. Like this is the huge thing. 
is going to make you happy. But yeah, and the reality is, if you're you know, the, if you're more happy uh, and you have you look at everything more holistically in terms of the different areas, you know, whether it's you know wealth, relationships, um, your health, um, you're actually going to probably make more money in the long term anyway. Hundred um, percent. There's that famous thing, isn't there? Like, you know, someone that loves what they do is going to like over a long term period of time, they're going to get rewarded from it. Like, if you become an expert in what you do and you and you actually do it because you love it, you're far more likely to be successful. And successful doesn't even mean financially; like, it can be happiness. Like, there's people yeah. that have got nothing. Look, look at people in yeah. some countries that are literally have nothing, but they're like happy. So they don't have that perspective of a flat bar. They don't have, they don't understand what that is to, to feel like that. And they don't have the, the situation of going through it to lose it. So it's, they, they, they generally can be quite happy. Obviously that's a, that's a, not a statement. <laughs> but no, but it's, it's true. I mean, when I was, when I was living out in, uh, when I was living out in Bali, you know, you see these uh, kids on the street and they're like dancing and smiling and, um, because they they don't know any different. It's amazing they they have literally, you know, almost nothing, um, but they still got a smile on their face a lot of the time. Um, so yeah, it's perspective, isn't it? Like if you look at like your value in which you get in life, that's got to be the most valuable moments. It's not about making ten x for a client. It's like that's that's part of what you do because you've got to do it to, to, you know, you're enjoying it, but it's, it's something you've got to do. But like the other stuff in helping people, I think this is like the part of your life that everyone should go towards helping someone. So I think this is, this is what makes you happier and actually more successful is when you help people. Yeah. I always say like fulfillment and having a purpose leads to mm. more happiness because really happiness is just an emotion. You know, sometimes you're not always going to wake up happy. You know, it's like we're always yeah. striving for, you know, being more happy. But the reality is you should be focusing more on being more fulfilled in what you do. Because Great. I find, especially as a man, if you don't have a purpose, like you can, you can soon get into a bad spiral. You want to know that when you get up in the morning, you, you, you're trying to conquer the world. You, 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 you want to achieve something. Mm. And I think that's the biggest thing. That's so. Good. <laughs> so Matt, um, let's, let's, let's wrap things up a little bit. One of the questions I wanted to ask was, uh, personally, is I just wanted to get your, uh, where, where you see Circulate going over the next sort of, uh, at least few years. What's your vision for the company? Uh, your, you and your brother, um, what are you trying to achieve? It'd be great to, to, to find that out. Yeah, so our, our company over the next two, three years, obviously looking to expand. Um, I think we want to work with more clients which are related to our sectors that we love. Um, we want to we want to win an award for the best working environment because that's, like I said, I'll keep consistent with it. It's like that is our goal is to have the best working environment because if we've got that, then things are running smooth. Um, so that's team happiness and all this kind of stuff. And I think really a lot of that, I, I could sit here and say, right, I want Circulate to be making 6 million, 7 million. But ultimately, like, I just want everyone to be happy. Like in our business, I want everyone to come in every day with a purpose. If we're making 2 million, 3 million, that's great. But I'd rather, I had an interesting conversation with Danny. I was like, wouldn't you just rather we had if you could sit there on X amount for the next year, but know that everything was going to work out and you'd be happy, would you prefer that than this quick growth? And he was like, yeah, I'd, I'd prefer everyone just to have a, a nice, comfortable kind of lifestyle, not no stress. And this obviously is like, this is, doesn't always exist, but this is like an ideal situation. Um, there's going to be days where you've got to work harder and days where you can, you know, finish a bit early and what have you. But like, I think our goal is to grow and scale, but do it sensibly. Like we, we don't want to overgrow to the point where we, we ruin our culture. So I think, I think for us, it's maintaining growth, but putting first our culture. 
is what's so I like that. And and I think the Daily Hustle show, that's where I want to put a lot of time into. So the Daily Hustle show is going to be huge for us. Like I said, this is going to be a really interesting channel for us to pick up new clients um, because it's all going to be based around business, developing strong cultures in your business, um, like fun, engaging content where we're going and touring different countries and doing fun stuff. Um, like, for example, one of the episodes, we actually want to go to Milan to see one of our clients and we want to do it on a budget. So we want to do the opposite of what like a, a high-flying entrepreneur would do. We want to do it on like a really low budget and see if it's possible. And like that might involve us like, you know, doing like uh, couch surfing or something like this. But filming the reality behind that situation is what we want to achieve on YouTube. Like, you know, nice. pe I want people to see that like it's not just like glitz and glamour. There's also a lot of like shit you've got to tread through. <laughs> so, on, like, you know what it's like when you go on client yeah. talks. Like, I, I've got one huge episode which we're going to put a lot of time into in the next couple of weeks, which I'm not going to say anything about because it's just got to be a massive surprise. But if it works out, I genuinely believe this episode's going to go viral. Like, and I, I think it's going to be hilarious because of the context in which we're doing something. Um, so I think, yeah, a lot of our energy is going to go into doing stuff like this. Like, we just want to have a, a fun kind of vibe around the agency. And I think when you when you set the foundation of that, I think everything else just falls into place. Obviously, just maintaining what we've got, making our team happier and doing some fun stuff along the way. And hopefully yeah. it just gets more valuable. <laughs> No, I love that. I love that. That's great. Where can my audience find you? Obviously, you've got the, the Daily Hustle, uh, yes. which I uh, take it on YouTube. If you if, if you type if in you Daily Hustle, it, then it comes up. And Daily is my surname, so D-A-L-E-Y. Um, uh, you can also check out Circulate. Um, so just Circulate Digital on any social platform, you'll probably find us. And then you can find me on Instagram. That's usually where I'm most active. It's just the Matt Daily. Um, and... That's pretty much the core areas. Um, we've got this podcast launching on Sunday, so that's going to be cool. I hope at some point you'll come on the podcast. Yeah, I'd love to, mate. That'd be great. It'd be really cool to get you on, and we can have some cool conversations on there. And, yeah, that's pretty much everything. But I've really enjoyed this this show. It's been really fun. And, um, yeah, thank you so much for having me on. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, it's been great to get you on the channel, Matt. Um, I appreciate, yeah, like I said, appreciate you coming on. All right, guys. Well, that obviously wraps up uh, another interview uh, with Matt Daly from Circulate. Please do me a favor, guys, and like the video, subscribe to my channel, and, and hit that notification bell. Uh, until next time, see you later. See you, guys. Yeah.